welcome to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. This is already part 9 of the wonderful reading and discussion of the book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. And today, again, as with all the other broadcasts, I have as my guest here um, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Still, if you have not had the chance to visit First Amendment Radio and listen to the daily readings and discussions that Tom Fress does over there, uh, go there and listen to Tom live. This is a recorded broadcast. There's not many, there's not much difference between him being recorded uh, and listen to it later on or listen to it live, um, because he is also live now, <laughs> not when you listen to it, but now. But uh, Tom Fress really is absolutely worth your while to listen to his readings and discussions. For the moment, he does the book Foundations Under Attack from Michael Desemlian, uh, which is a continuation of a book that he read in 2009 and which I am uploading on my channel for the moment, All Roads Lead to Rome. But today we have found together here on Skype to do another reading of the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. I'm going to continue on the bottom of page 49 in the last paragraph, but before that, of course, I want to introduce you to Tom and uh, welcome him to the broadcast. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Hello, Jörg. Uh, blessings to you and your listeners. I'm very happy to be here. It's a blessing. It is, it is a blessing for me also that you can take a little uh, time out of your life and share with me on Skype that we are doing this reading here. But um, for the people who have not heard that yet, I will say it again. This book, uh, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, actually is a, uh, a summary of everything, more or less, that you have been teaching for more than 10 years on ham radio, on amateur radio, and now on First Amendment radio with your ministry, uh, Inquisition Update. It's a very good book, there's no doubt about it. Futurism and preterism together have steered God's people away from the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy, one held by Bible believers throughout the centuries, it's called historicism, and in our generation, it's almost been forgotten, and we're restoring those old paths. The correct interpretation of Bible prophecy is the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy. When God prophesies a thing to happen, it happens perfectly and completely, just the way he prophesies it, and we recognize the fulfillment, the precise and complete fulfillment of those prophecies in history and that's how the interpreters of the of the prophecies the prophets correctly interpreted the prophecies by simply looking at history for their fulfillment and when god fulfills a prophecy then we know when he fulfills a prophecy in history then we know we have a more sure word of prophecy and we have a correct understanding now, the preterist view says that Bible prophecy was fulfilled before 70 A.D. or at the latest 410 A.D. at the fall of the old pagan Roman Empire and that we're living in the kingdom of Christ in our generation for the last 2,000 years. And we're building this kingdom of Christ. But what, we don't, what we're never told is that, that, that this so-called kingdom of Christ is headed up by the papacy. You see, historicists believed that the prophecies of the Scripture were fulfilled all throughout the Christian era, and that this Christian era, this 2,000 years, was ruled over by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy. And so, preterism exonerates the papacy of that onus, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And likewise, futurism says that Bible prophecies, the prophecies of the Bible will be fulfilled until the distant future, and the man of sin won't be revealed until then. And in the meantime, we have to build this kingdom of Christ. On earth. On earth. Yes, on earth, an earthly kingdom, not a heavenly one, an earthly one. Where Jesus Christ said, 
my kingdom is not from hence. If my yes. kingdom was from this world, my servants would fight. That's right. And so both futurism and preterism together exonerate the papacy and put all of Bible prophecy either in the distant past or the distant future, and that God has gone to sleep all throughout the Christian era. <laughs> and we're just either looking back on the, the bygone days of the ancient pagan Roman Empire, or we're looking forward to a future empire, and that the interpretation of Bible prophecy is, is uh, free to uh, unfold at every whim. In other words, it's all speculation. There's nothing verified yet in history. It's which conspiracy is theory, Tom. It's conspiracy theory, that's right. Futurism is a theory and that uh, can be bantered around and argued about, and they do argue. There's premillennials, postmillennials, and mid-millennials, and, and every other cockamamie per permutation of error. And the truth is in historicism. It's the only it's the only interpretation of Bible prophecy that makes perfect sense, common sense, and historical sense. And this is what we hope to restore in the so-called Protestant world today, if it still exists at all. I have a little sentence for you to think about um, and uh, elaborate with us. Okay. Futurism is the foundation for the success of ecumenism. That's right. Futurism and preterism together are essential elements of the ecumenical reunion of the Protestant churches back into the Roman Catholic Church. Without futurism, Tom, the ecumenical movement could have never taken place. Could never, could never have happened. Vatican Council II could never have happened without futurism. No, futurism, without the acceptance without the acceptance of all the Protestants of the futurist teaching. Yes, yes. Not without futurism, but the, but that the people believe it, Tom. Yes. That they have been deceived into believing this heinous lie. Yes. That is the problem. You know, it's not the problem to put a lie out there for the people. The problem is when the people believe this lie because they are, uh, pardon my words, whether too dumb or too lazy or too ignorant to pick up the Bible, the real Bible, the 1611 King James Bible, and check if that what is taught in the world is in accordance with the Word of God. That's right. And I'm not speaking about our American listeners only. I'm speaking about my quote-unquote German brethren, European brethren, I speak about everybody who has access to a Bible, which yes. in 2017 is almost everybody thanks to the Internet as long as we have it. Yeah. But this ignorance, Tom, that is what kills me. Yes. I often cannot grasp it that they would allow this futurist lie to build the ecumenism on, and in the meantime, all the so-called Protestant churches go flying back to Rome. Yeah. Look, a lie, like futurism, to reiterate what you're saying, just to say it in a different way, a lie like futurism would have no power at all unless it is believed. And in this case, this lie called futurism is believed by virtually everybody. All the churches of whatever denomination, they all teach it. There are a few yet that still teach preterism, for sure. But one is no better than the other. And these lies, both preterism and futurism, would have no power whatsoever in the world unless they were believed upon. And so the ecumenical movement back to Rome would be an impossibility if nobody believed these lies, preterism and futurism. 
but it's because of preterism and futurism and the and the widespread or the almost it's it's almost referred to as orthodoxy now it is orthodoxy tom it, is, is, it has become it the, the common orthodox agreed, teaching. it is the common yes. agreed teaching in all the churches yes it doesn't matter what denomination you are what church you go to the common ground that you have is futurism and preterism that's you, right. Do you and think it, it, what it, what I experienced, Tom, on some comments on my channel, and sometimes when I comment about on another video on the Antichrist, and people answer me, do you think what uh, do you know what I think is the worst thing that they answer me? What? Okay, the Pope is the Antichrist, but when will the tri when will the Rapture be? Yeah. And the tribulation, they yeah. mix, Tom, and this is to me the worst experience. They mix the two teachings. Okay, the yeah. papacy is the Antichrist, but hey, we will be raptured out. Yeah. When will we have a rapture? Pre-trip, yeah. mid-trip, post-trip, and what tribulation? Yeah. I, 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 I sometimes write back, what tribulation are you talking about? Yeah. The tribulation that Jesus Christ spoke about was, we will have tribulation in all our life. What what Yerk has just described to you listeners is a person that has one foot in historicism and yet one foot still in futurism. Mixing historicism with futurism, trying to be both historicist and futurist at the same time. And they have nothing but questions, no answers. All they have is questions. The way to get all of your questions answered is to come completely out of futurism and put both feet in historicism. Then you have all the answers to your questions. Who is the Antichrist? Well, it's the one who succeeded the Caesars of the old Roman Empire. And that can be none other than the papacy. <laughs> and, uh, excuse me, And the papacy has ruled over the kings of the earth for the, the entire Christian era up to this point. From roughly the 6th century all the way to the present time. Killing the saints. Perverting the Bibles. Burning the true word of God. Ruling over the kings of the earth, using the civil powers of the nations to persecute true Bible-believing Christians. And uh, the whole world misses it because they believe in futurism or preterism. And when they become aware that the papacy and only the papacy can is fulfilling these Bible prophecies throughout the Christian era... They want to hang on to the juicy part of futurism, which is a, a, so, a so-called rapture. It's nowhere taught in the Bible. The Bible says otherwise. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And those who think they're going to be raptured out before this man of sin, this son of perdition, starts the so-called seven years of great tribulation, are living in a, a dream because the seven years that is said in the futurist churches to represent the seven years of great tribulation is taken from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. The seven years that Christ was on the earth from his baptism three and a half years later to his crucifixion, three and a half years after that, to the going forth of the gospel to the Gentiles and the salvation of Cornelius. There is no future 70th week. The 70th week of Daniel, the seven years, first there were seven weeks of years, then there were 62 weeks of years, together making 69 weeks of years, there's only one week left. One seven-year period of time. And that was Jesus' ministry. If you can read Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, and see that it only applies to Jesus Christ, our Messiah, 
there's no mention made whatsoever of an antichrist or a son of perdition, that it speaks of Jesus and only Jesus, then you come to the right interpretation, you come to the right interpretation, the historical interpretation, which shows that Jesus came at the end of the 69th week of years. His ministry lasted for three and a half years when he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease in the midst of that week, three and a half years later, and then the gospel three and a half years later going to the Gentiles. You have a complete fulfillment of that 70th and final week of years. Now, all of this stuff about a seven-year tribulation that's supposed to take place in the future is literally taken from that prophecy. There is no one other week of years, no other seven-year period of time spoken of in the Bible. When you so you read. have to know that every element that you've been taught about a seven-year period of time, every element that they have associated with that so-called seven-year period of time is a fraud, an absolute, utter fraud that is so easily explained that it makes you sick to your stomach to realize how many people believe the lie. And you, 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 you said the word ignorant. Yeah, I did. And, and I'm accused of being too hard on God's people and beating them over the head with a club. There's no need to beat people. The, the, the truth of the matter is, is the truth is so much more explainable, more understandable, more believable than any futurist interpretation as to be laughable. Yeah, Tom. Let me go back to this uh, to this one week. You know, when you read Daniel nine, verse yeah. twenty six. Okay. Yeah. After three score and two weeks, which was preceded by seven weeks. That's right. Shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself? That's now right. we make a little trip to Matthew twenty seven, verse fifty. Mm -hmm. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost yep so what does this speak about the messiah or some kind of antichrist who yeah. who by <laughs> of course in that time when at verse 27 we read in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease that was Jesus because in Matthew 27, verse 51, we read, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the That's earth right. did quake and the rocks rent. That's right. Jesus fulfilled the Mosaic law, the Mosaic ceremonial law, yep. with his death on the cross, after three score and two weeks, which was preceded by seven weeks, so after 69th week, and everybody with two working brain cells knows that after 69 comes 70. That's In right. the 70th week, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, the Bible says. Who was he then cut off for? Us. The people who believed in him, the people That's who right. got washed by his blood from right. their sin. That's right. And you you said the key part that assures us that it was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when it is recorded in history, in the New Testament, the most reliable record of history the world has, that the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, thus falling open in two pieces fully exposing the so-called holy of holies. And there was no way that the priest could enter then the holy of holies with blood to offer and sprinkle upon the mercy seat because that whole system depended upon that veil being intact and separating the holy place, the holy place from the most holy place. That put a screeching halt to the ceremonial, the sacrificial law. Jesus was the lamb. That's it. You accept him or not. 
but you're not going to go back into that temple and offer animal blood on the mercy seat when the true Lamb of God has shed his own blood. And there you just okay? said that is precise. That is precisely. That's yeah. precisely why God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom to put a permanent end to animal sacrifices or any other sacrifice, whether it be the mass of the Roman Catholic Church or the Jewish sacrifice of lambs. There's no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He manifested himself at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel when he was when he was baptized in the river Jordan. He became the sacrifice three and a half years later in the midst of the week, confirming the covenant of the kingdom in his own blood. That's it. No more need for a temple. No more need for a sacrificial priesthood. There's only now the universal priesthood of believers. We are the priests and kings of this, kin of this, of this kingdom. It exists today. He is our king. We have a king, we have a law, and we have a nation. It's called the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And we await his return. And in the meantime, we have to deal with all of these lies. We have to expose all these lies so that the kingdom of heaven will be open to the rest of the world who are up to this point blinded either by preterism or futurism. That's the whole mission of Inquisition Update. I know that's your mission, and it's the mission of this book, to open the kingdom of heaven to all those who have been deceived by preterism and futurism and popery. Do you realize, and this is, you're going to have to listen carefully. Your listeners are going to have to listen carefully to this. This is a point that's not brought out in this book, but one that makes perfect logical, historical, and prophetic, and scriptural sense. You're going to instantly recognize it, those of you who have ears to hear and eyes to see. If you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, you have literally denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. And the Bible plainly says that is the spirit of Antichrist. And where do we get this futurist belief? From the Roman Catholic Church. It has taught it since the earliest days of the Roman Catholic Church. It has taught it has taught preterism and it has taught futurism to stifle dissent within the Roman Catholic Church and Catholics who have read their Bible and came to the same conclusion as did the Protestant Reformers, the papacy is the Antichrist spoken of in the Scripture. Preterism was used to silence them, so was futurism. It was, it was, it was created, both of them were created by the Roman Catholic Church to silence dissent within the Church, and it has just simply been transplanted into the Protestant world to stifle the dissent of Protestantism against the papacy. And what, again, what futurism asserts is that the 70th week of Daniel has not been fulfilled. It will be fulfilled in the future. And the 70th week of Daniel, if properly and historically understood as it is written in the authorized King James Version of the Bible, it was the, the very seven-year ministry of Christ on the earth. The first three and a half years by Christ in the flesh, Messiah in the flesh, and the last three and a half years, Messiah in the Spirit, through the Spirit-led apostles continuing their witness to Jerusalem and the Jews for another three and a half years. And when the, th the end of that 70th week came, the gospel went to the Gentiles, and the first Gentiles were saved. And after that, the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed, the whole thing ended. 
Daniel's prophecy has been perfectly and completely fulfilled. It, it heralds the timing of the coming of Messiah. And if you say the 70th week is future, you have literally denied, whether you know it or not, you have literally denied that Messiah has come in the flesh, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's the spirit of the Roman Catholic Church. That is the spirit of the papacy, because the papacy created this futurist lie. Do you realize, I'm going to say it again, if you're futurist, you believe in a seven-year tribulation, a seven-year uh, a rapture sometime during that seven-year period, you have believed the spirit of Antichrist. You have believed the spirit of the papacy. The papacy desperately needs you to believe in futurism or preterism. Take your pick. The Pope doesn't care what error you believe in so long as you believe in an error that exonerates him because in this future seven-year period of time that they have taught you to believe in, they're going to present to you the papacy as the Christ, the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and he will be the head of this earthly global kingdom, a counterfeit kingdom of Christ. And it is not of the Spirit of God, not even one element of it. There's no truth in any of it. If you hold to any element of this futurist teaching, you are literally denying that Messiah has come in the flesh. That is the spirit of Antichrist. Frightful thing, but there's no other way to cut it. No other way to explain a future seven-year period of time but that they robbed Jesus Christ of his 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. It was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, confirmed the covenant with his own blood. Okay? That was the coming of the Messiah. Daniel prophesied, about the Messiah and his coming and gave a precise calendar date when he would come. After the 69th week of years, 483 years, then Christ would come, be baptized in the River Jordan, three and a half years later, become the sacrifice, confirm the covenant in his own blood. God would confirm it by ripping the veil of the temple, thus bringing all animal sacrifices to a screeching halt. Three and a half years after three and a half years of rejecting Christ as their Savior, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Jerusalem was destroyed. There's your fulfillment. If you look for a future one, you have been deceived. You've been deceived by the spirit of Antichrist, which is manifest in futurism. How many ways can I say it? How many more perfect ways can I say what is easily understandable, which makes perfect sense, makes far more sense than anything that's taught in the churches today? So what can we say about the churches today? They are synagogues of Satan. They have the spirit of Antichrist in every one of them. And if you were Satan and you wanted to deceive the whole world, where would you most likely choose to be your platform? Why, in those very places that are reserved for the preaching of the gospel, the churches themselves. And that's exactly where he stands today. Sad, more than sad, but true. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Listen carefully. Satan is transformed into an angel of light, and therefore his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Your pastors. All of them. They're either preterist or they're futurist. There's not a historicist among them that I'm aware of. And if there are historicists out there, they ought to have your support.
There's nothing but desolation in the churches. There's nothing but the spirit of Antichrist that rules them. You better stay home and read the authorized King James Version for yourself. Start with the book of Daniel. That's right. Start with Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. Read the whole chapter. It's unbelievable. Daniel poured out his heart to the Lord. He understood why they were in Babylonian captivity. Because they fell into idolatry. And he was repenting for himself and for his whole nation. And because of his contrition, because of his acknowledgement of the sin of Israel, God sent the angel Gabriel to tell Daniel when their Messiah would come. Exactly 483 years after the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. 69 prophetic years of seven years each. 483 years. Now, the prophecy was for 70 weeks, 490 literal years. If Jesus came at 483 years, that means there's only seven years left, right? That's the week. There were first, there were seven weeks, then 62 weeks, all together making 69 weeks. There's one week to go. And that Jesus fulfilled himself. That was his ministry. Jesus is, if you'll permit me, Jesus is and was the 70th week of Daniel. The New Testament is the historical record that Jesus perfectly fulfilled Daniel's prophecy exactly on time, exactly as Daniel prophesied it, and he did exactly what Daniel said he would come to do. He caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. He was cut off, but not for himself. There's nothing left of Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled. It was perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And if you believe any portion of that 70th week of Daniel prophecy belongs in the future, you have believed a lie. You have believed the spirit of the papacy. You have believed the spirit of Antichrist. And don't you know the rapture is supposed to take place during that future 70th week of Daniel? What does that make the rapture? A lie. A bald-faced lie. You have hope only in the resurrection of the righteous. That comes at the last trump. There's only one last trump. God does not say the last trump when there are many last trumps. The dead in Christ shall rise first, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the last trump. That's the calling up of the saints of God. That's the rapture. Both from the grave and both from, there's your rapture, and don't call it a rapture. It's the resurrection of the righteous. Call it what the Bible calls it. Don't get caught using the word rapture because it is rooted in a lie. A futurist lie. You can't mix the holy with the profane. You can't mix what God said with the words of men. Lying words of men. There's a point, sadly, that's not made in this book or any of the other fantastic Protestant works that I've read and discussed on my broadcast on Inquisition Update. The point that is missed by all of the sages of Protestantism is that believing in a future 70th week of Daniel is literally to deny that Jesus came in the flesh, that Messiah came in the flesh 2,000 years ago. Yes, I know you believe in Jesus. You read the Bible. You preach the Bible in churches. You believe, but you also believe in a future 70th week. You can't have it both ways. You can't believe Messiah came as Daniel prophesied that he would 
in in the seventieth week of Daniel, and then believe in a future and a, a future seven year period of time. You've contradicted yourself. Your Satan has made you a laughing stock. He's made you to contradict your own common sense. Look, I can speak authoritatively about this because I fell into the futurist lie. I was never taught anything but the futurist lie all my life. And it, God brought me kicking and screaming to the reality of historicism. To believe what I believe today, is it just defies all of my upbringing. I was born in a futurist church. I was raised in a futurist church. I became a man, a married man in a futurist church, and I went my whole adult life believing in futurism until God had mercy on me and delivered me from that delusion that has deceived the whole world. Now I know when my Messiah came. He came in the 70th week of Daniel, and all this future talk of the 70th week of Daniel is just to damn all of God's people. The whole purpose of a future 70th week is to cause you to eat and drink damnation to yourself. Rome has in store that you will all share a common communion with the Roman Catholic Church, that you will all participate in your Protestant perversion of the Roman Catholic Mass. That's what Rome has in store for you if you believe in a future is 70th week of Daniel. That the papacy is going to be elevated to the God of this world. And all the kings of the earth are going to worship and obey him. And those who still insist that he is the Antichrist of Scripture, that there is no futurist, futurist interpretation of the prophecies, we are going to be enemy number one. But I don't fear him who can destroy the body. I only fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. God brought me to the truth. My hope and my salvation is in him. And he came 2,000 years ago, just as Daniel prophesied. The whole future scheme is a lie straight from the pit of hell because it denies that Messiah has come in the flesh. I could say it over and over and over again all afternoon. But if you've been given eyes to see and ears to hear and God has shed his grace and his mercy upon you, you don't need me to say it one more time. You already understand how Satan has made a mockery of God's people. Now, let's walk away from our error and pick up where the historicists left off. The Protestant belief, we know who the Antichrist is, and we already know his lying scheme to destroy the whole world. Let's fight against it. In Jesus' name, the name of our Messiah, the 70th week of Daniel, praise his holy name. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. When I wanted to interrupt you about 20 minutes ago, that was exactly what I wanted to say, but not with men that many and eloquent words as you did, of course. I wanted to say, well, point out that when you deny that Jesus Christ fulfilled Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, you have actually denied Jesus Christ. That's right. But you did that in a, in a much better way than I could express myself. Therefore, my thanks, Tom. And um, before I start with the reading in a moment, I want to point to something else. You know, I hardly advertise on my videos, on my channel, anybody else. Why? Because there hardly is anybody else out there who teaches the, the same truth. I advise Jesse Vessel, who has, um, well, left his ministry since already more than six months found somewhere in the world probably and is not doing any work for the lord for the moment we just can hope and pray that he comes back and continues his ministry because he was very well learned in the scripture and did very very good interesting videos 
I advise Brett Norman, who also sometimes um, visits us in these broadcasts, and sometimes uh, and 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 some someone that I have a little personal problem with. But setting that aside, I have to say at this moment because we are speaking about the rapture. If you want to learn from somebody else than Tom Fress or Joggler 66, telling you that the rapture will not take place, go to First Amendment Radio. Nicholas Arthur, who runs that site, that radio station, wrote a book called The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. It is not a book, it is more like a booklet, like the one that we have here. It is not that thick, I think it has 120, 130 pages, something like that. And it deals foremost with the rapture that will be cancelled. And you can get that book for free on First Amendment Radio. In that book, there is a lot of truth in it and there are a lot of things that you can read for yourself to understand that the whole 70th week 2000 or more years gap and the whole rapture theory is nothing but a lie from the antichrist who has one goal and one goal only and that is to take as many souls with him into perdition as he can and therefore he will use all means necessary people all means deception murder falsifying i i probably don't even know enough english words to express what all the measures will be that satan will take to get you he is out there to get you. And God offers you the free gift of salvation. You only have to take it. It's a free gift. You don't have to do anything for it. No works. Nothing. Surely no sacraments. Nothing. It's a free gift. But therefore you have to understand that the Messiah who offers you that gift died for you on the cross as the fulfillment of the 70th weeks of Daniel 2,000 years ago. Now I'm going to start reading on page 49 in the book, unless Tom has a little comment before I start. No, no, ready to go. Okay. Um, there's a little, uh, how do you say that, uh, a little frame here in this book uh, with a uh, with a quote from Duncan McDougall, uh, which I read already last time in the broadcast, but after what we started with this broadcast, I think it is imperative that I read that again. Duncan McDougall, who is cited here from the Rapture of the Saints, was one of Scotland's well-known Gaelic scholars, holding linguistic degrees in Latin, in Greek, in Hebrew, and in Gaelic, which is the old French, for the people who do not know that. And the quote is very important to get us started off in this broadcast, where we read the next part of the origin of futurism and preterism, and it goes as follows. Quote, I will venture to assert that, and please listen closely, I will venture to assert that there is not a Bible teacher nor anyone else living in the world today who has found a secret rapture in the Bible by his own independent study of the Bible itself. These teachers all come to the Bible with cut and dried theories which they have learned elsewhere and twist and torture texts to fit the theory. If the spiritual pedigree of the futurist Bible teacher could be traced back, they would all be found to spring from one source, Lacunza, the Jesuit." Unquote. Now, historical records show that the personal, family and business life of uh, Cyrus Ingers and Schofield included dishonest business practices, unpaid debts and refusal to support his wife and family. So he really was a godly man in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church. Eh? Yeah. This was only a part of the immoral character of the man who was to later publish a study Bible that would influence, no, that would brainwash multiplied millions of quote-unquote Christians worldwide. 
for a complete history of his life and work, read Joseph M. Canfield's book entitled The Incredible Schofield, which you can get from the same ministry that published this book. But now comes a very important sentence, and I have to elaborate a little bit on later. With the sponsorship of James H. Brooks, a diehard Derbyite, and later the leadership of Arnold C. Gablin, Schofield was accepted into the Fellowship of the Bible Conferences at Niagara Falls in New York. Now, why do I have to elaborate on this sentence a little bit? <coughs> on my second YouTube channel, Joggler's War on Disinfo, I upload since the time, and I'm not very fast with that, I know, but I upload a lecture from Bill Hughes in 55 parts, which is called Behind the Door that preceded him writing the book The Secret Terrorists and uh, The Enemy Unmasked. So it is a very interesting series where all the facts that come to pop up in the two books mentioned are talked about in that series. And uh, I was producing, I don't know, part 14, 15, 16, somewhere the last weeks. And while producing that, um, Bill Hughes often cites, or often he, <laughs> he almost exclusively cites in his lectures books written by other people. And one of the books that he cited in one of the lectures that I was uh, listening to while producing the video was from Arnold C. Gablin, the one that we, I just mentioned here in the sentence, The Conflict of the Ages. And that is a book that was first published in 1933. And of course, I looked them up because, oh, when Bill Yu cites this book, that must be very interesting. I want to read that book. So I got that book for free on the Internet as a PDF. And if you ask me in the, uh, in the comment section of the video, I can provide to you the link or you can look it up for yourself. The Conflict of the Ages yeah, by Arno C. Gabelin, who is from descendants, uh, some kind of a German family, I guess, how the name is written. Um, that guy is a very, very subtle in his lies. I have read through the first 72 pages of its 172 page long book. I have made a lot of comments in there, but I found out through more research that he also published a study on Daniel 9. And of course, I found in that study the futurist deception. So when I'm reading here in this book, with the sponsorship of James H. Brooks, a die-hard Darbyite, meaning someone who believes the uh, yeah Dar Darbyite, uh, I, I don't even know who that is, but uh, John uh, John Nelson Darby. Ah, uh, yeah, John follows. Nelson Darby. Okay, yeah, yes. okay, I know, I know who he is. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> I yeah. was I was mixing that up with Darwin. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's John Nelson Darby, yeah. And later the leadership of Arnold C. Gablian, Schofield was accepted into the fellowship of the Bible conferences. So you see birds of a uh, uh, birds of a feather flock together. Or how do you say that's that in right. English? Right? That's right. Arnold birds C. Gablian flock together. Yeah. Arnold C. Gablian and Schofield are two of the same kind in their teaching. And That's in right. that book, The Conflict of the Ages, even though there are a lot of interesting things, and I probably will read that later on on my channel, that book, there are a lot of things that you have to be aware of. And that has to do with futurism and with the rapture that we already spoke about. Yeah. Now it was here and another conference, uh, the author continues, where the quote-unquote lost truth of futurism was hammered out. Schofield developed his notes to place in the margins of his now famous Bible. The Schofield marginal notes to millions of unsuspecting Christians have become as sacred as the word of God itself. Again, I'm sorry, I have to make a comment. You'll hear Tom and me constantly pounding on the point, there is only one true preserved Bible in the English language today in 2017 and that is the 1611 King James Bible there are many people who say yeah, but what about the Geneva Bible you know the Bible that was used by Calvin that was first written in 1560 republished in 1599 what about that 
Yerk because it has the same foundations. It's also mainly based on the Textus Receptus. I tell you one thing where the Geneva Bible differentiates very, very much in from the King James Bible. And that is the footnotes. When we read here in the book the Schofield marginal notes, to millions of unsuspecting Christians have become as sacred as the word of God itself. It is the writing of men that is mixed in with the word of God that betrays most of the people. Because people love to hear the preaching of man. They love to hear the interpretation of a man. How does this guy interpret, in, interpret this and this and this part of the Bible? The King James Bible, people, is the only Bible who expl which explains itself. It does not need footnotes. The other Bibles do. And therefore, I do never advise the other Bibles, but will always advise the King James Bible. Do you have a thought on that, Tom? Yes, and, and not to be contradictory at all, but many of the supporters of the Geneva Bible support it on the basis that in the footnotes of, the, of that Bible, it is clearly outlined that the papacy is the Antichrist. And those who support the, the, uh, the, uh, the Geneva Bible criticize those of us who hold strictly to the King James Bible because it has no such footnotes in it claiming that the papacy is the Antichrist. And they put us in the rank of those who are trying to cover up the papacy as the Antichrist to to keep that a secret. But I, I, I refuse I refuse that criticism as ridiculous. Here we are. We promote the King James Bible and, and we show in history and in prophecy and in scripture that there is no other entity on the in the history of the world that fulfills the, the prophecies regarding the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist but that the papacy itself is that fulfillment. And uh, uh, we have no criticism, or at least I don't. I'll speak personally of my own self. I have no criticism of the Geneva Bible that, that has footnotes that point to the papacy as the fulfillment of these prophecies. But in the Cyrus Schofield Bible, which I was brought up as, a, as an adult, in, a, in an independent Baptist church, I was recommended by my pastor to get a Schofield reference Bible. That was the Bible that he preached from, and it is full of Cyrus Schofield's own uh, footnotes. And Cyrus Schofield was a dyed-in-the-wool futurist. He believed that the 70th week of Daniel was yet future, thus denying that Jesus was was the Christ, the Messiah, and who came 2,000 years ago. Now, I wasn't told that. I wasn't told that the 70th week of Daniel is the fulfillment of the seven years of Christ's ministry on the earth 2,000 years ago. I was convinced by Cyrus Schofield and my Cyrus Schofield pastor that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. It's the same thing that I was taught as a youngster in a Pentecostal church, and all through my upbringing, they believe in the same nonsense, and uh, the, the, you cannot accuse the Geneva Bible of making that same mistake. There are those that are very faithful to the Geneva Bible, and they're faithful to it because of those of those footnotes describing the papacy as the Antichrist, showing how the papacy historically fulfilled those prophecies of the Antichrist. I can't criticize them for that. But the Cyrus Schofield Bible, in the footnotes, it denied that the papacy is the Antichrist. All right? And it, did not, it says that the Antichrist won't come until this futurist 70th week of Daniel. And so these footnotes in the Schofield Reference Bible are lethal poison to God's people.
absolutely lethal poison to God's people. And I had taken it hook, line, and sinker. My Baptist pastor recommended that I buy a Schofield Reference Bible. That's the Bible that he preached from. That's the Bible that I ought to get. And I did what he said. I got that Schofield Reference Bible, and I studied it day in, day out for a decade. I went to men's Bible study groups. I went to Sunday morning service. I went to Sunday evening service, Tuesday night men's Bible study, and I was at home reading the Cyrus Schofield Bible. I was soaked in futurism from stem to stern. There wasn't one cell of my body that wasn't drenched in futurism. From, from, from my perspective, looking back on it, there was no hope for me to know, ever know the truth. But God delivered me from that futurist lie. And how did he do it? In private. One night at work, while reading Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, I read how he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And contrary to everything that I'd ever been taught my whole life, I realized, I knew, the Spirit of God told me, deep down in the marrow of my bones, this is speaking of no future Antichrist. This is speaking of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And I knew it had consequences in my life that I had not yet even comprehended. And I sat on that knowledge for an old, over a decade before I ever did anything with it. And ever since, God has confirmed to me the truth of the matter. And now I find out that what I now believe is the historical belief of all Christians, all true Bible-believing Christians, all the way back to the first churches and even the Thessalonian church that Paul preached to. They believed that that power that would succeed the Caesars would be the man of sin. And I understand it now perfectly. It was Jesus who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. And it is the papacy that has denied that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. Confirmed. God has confirmed to me the truth over and over and over and over again since I repented of futurism. And I'll never look back. I can only look forward to his glorious return because I know in whom I have trusted I know in whom I believe. I believe the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, my Messiah, the one Jesus fulfilled. And, uh, and now I know, deep down in the marrow of my bones, what the man of sin in Rome has in store for the world who believe the futurist lie. It's a hideous reality. But if you own a Schofield Reference Bible, there's only one thing you can do with it. Only one thing. And that is to light a fire in the burning barrel in the backyard or in the, far, in the fireplace in your house and burn every page until it is ash. Don't give it away. Don't put it in the trash so somebody could dig it out. Burn it. It is a futurist Bible. It is, it is diabolical in its content. Even though, even though the text of the scriptures are faithful to the majority text, faithful to the King James Version of the Bible, it is the footnotes that destroy that Bible and make it the enemy of God. Get yourself an unmolested King James Bible and read it like your life depends on it, because it does. Back to you, York. Your eternal life depends on it. That's right. So the Schofield Marginal Notes to millions of unsuspecting Christians have become as sacred as the Word of God itself. Don't mix the holy with the profane. 
Don't add to the word of God, don't take from it. The notes of Schofield, the marginal notes of Schofield, are not as sacred as the word of God. Only the word of God is sacred because he sanctified it himself. He said, once I have spoken something, I will never take it away, and, my, and, the, and the earth will go away, and the heaven will go away, but my word will not go away. Not the words of man, not the notes of men, the word of God. Thus the historical trail of the prophetic interpretation of a vast number of quote-unquote protestants today can be easily traced to the Jesuit priests Emmanuel Lacunza, who have we been talking about in earlier broadcasts, Francisco Ribera and company. Now follows a little quote from Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom is a Dutch evangelist who lived between 1892 and 1983 and she is quoted here from the book Rapture, Prophecy or Heresy by H. W. Speed Wilson on page 74 as follows. Quote, the Rapture doctrine is a false teaching that Jesus warned us to expect in the latter days. Unquote. Oh, did our Lord warn us of what to expect in the latter days. Scoffers yeah. will come. Here is Christ, there is Christ. Don't believe it, he said. That is a reference to the Eucharist, the sacrament, so-called, of the Roman Catholic Church. Without, there is no salvation, according to the Antichrist itself. Jesus Christ warned us of all these things, and when you follow Tom's advice, and my advice, and read this, 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible, you will learn these things. Otherwise, we can make from this a broadcast for 24 hours, citing all the quotations of Jesus Christ in the Bible. And by the way, a point that has been not mentioned yet, the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel is to be found in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. All these four Gospels from the very first until the very last word, give a uh, testimony of Jesus Christ's three and a half years ministry on the earth, until he was, as Daniel 9 says, was cut off in the middle of the week, but not for himself. Right. If you want to read about the 70th week, just turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, Lucas, or the Gospel of John. All four of them are a proof of Jesus, his ministry, and of the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. Amen. Every time when you pick up the Bible and you read in the Gospel, say to yourself, now I'm reading the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, according to Matthew, according to Lucas, to Mark, or to John. There you have four witnesses. The scripture says, by two or three witnesses, let everything be established. God gave us four independent witnesses of the historical fulfillment in Christ of Daniel's 70th week. It's a perfect, infallible, historical record proving that Daniel's 70th week has been fulfilled by Messiah the Prince. So if you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, you have denied that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. You have denied that Jesus is the Messiah. You have denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. You've denied the historical record of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Back to you, Yerk. The author continues on the last paragraph on page 50, False Hope. Throughout the development of the futurist interpretation of prophecy, the advocates of this false theory, of this false theory, have capitalized on certain quote-unquote future events which they feel are extremely critical. They include the mark of the beast, 
false hope for that that is in the future. So that means that the mark of the beast is already here. That's right. Now, if Tom and I are getting off the leech right now and tell you what the mark of the beast really is, you will smash your computer and never watch a video of me or Tom again. <laughs> so, I'm not doing that. That is for some other broadcast or to find out for yourself. But it is under the pretense here of false hope that these quote-unquote future events includes the mark of the beast. You do with it as you please. I and Tom could tell you if only you would want to hear. Mm -hmm. It also includes a one-world government and, of course, a one-world church. These two go hand in hand. Why? Right. Because the fourth beast of Daniel's prophecy was diverse from all the others. And what makes the fourth beast diverse from all the others? That you have a church and state combination. In the kingdom of Babylon you had a king, and next to the king you had a high priest. In the kingdom of Medo-Persia you had a king, and next to the king you had a high priest. In the kingdom of Greece you had a king, and next to the king you had a high priest. In pagan Rome, you had Caesar and you had his priesthood. But in papal Rome, you have the Pontifex Maximus combining the, priest king. combining the priest and the king in one person, making himself a term that is in the Bible only uh, given to Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There you go. So here in the book it says a one world government and church which they are ignorantly helping to create. This one world government and one world church. This one world church is what this ecumenical movement is all about. And why you are busy studying the ecumenical movement, you don't see that the Roman Catholic Church, under the guise of Christianity, is a political power that reigneth over the kings of the earth, as the That's Bible right. says, righteously in Revelation 17 and 18. Mm -hmm. The establishment of the Zionist state of Israel as being the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Yes, the establishment of the Zionist state of Israel as being the fulfillment of Bible prophecy only if you put the Bible prophecy of Daniel's 70th week into the future. The state of Israel is not in the Bible prophecy of the New Testament. There is no resurrected state of Israel. Because Israel is the body of Christ. Means the people who believe in Jesus Christ. Who follow his commandments. That is Israel. And we've elaborated on that on earlier broadcasts. So I don't want to go too deep into that. The present day Jewish people as being the totality of all 12 tribes of Israel. A seven year tribulation period, the author continues, well we have expounded on that the first half hour. And the highly prized lucrative doctrine, the secret rapture of the church. Now I think with all my comments you probably didn't get the gist of the sentence, so I'm going to read the complete sentence again. They include... We are speaking about the false hope and certain future events. These future events include the mark of the beast, a one world government and church, which they are ignorantly helping to create, the establishment of the Zionist state of Israel as being the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, the present day, which, uh, the present day Jewish people as being the totality of all 12 tribes of Israel, a seven-year tribulation period and their highly prized lucrative doctrine, the secret rapture of the church. 
Now, there's still one part of the sentence that I have to make a comment on. I know Tom will fall into it in, in, right when I, in, when I do this. It says here between brackets, um, uh, a one-world government and church between brackets, which they are ignorantly helping to create. Who is they? They are all the, as Tom so very well likes to call them, the evangelibellies. The people who have been caught in the evangelical ecumenist movement. The people who have accepted the futurist teaching of the Antichrist are helping to create the quote-unquote new world order that they are so fearful of and that they quote-unquote don't even want. How do they help to create that? Well, very simple. I can say it in my own words. Tom has much better words to say that, but um, I say it in my own words. He can come into in a moment. When you deny the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, here he goes again. Yes, it all goes back to that prophecy of Daniel. When you deny Jesus being the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, you deny that Jesus Christ was come in the flesh. You deny the historical, biblical and prophetic Antichrist. And when you deny the papacy being the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist and looking for a futurist one, the Antichrist, the papacy, tells you, well, if I am not the Antichrist, then you have to restore me into all the glory that I had before the Reformation. Because the Reformation and you guys coming up as quote-unquote Protestants who protested me as Antichrist, which now you accept that I am not, you have to reinstall me into all my former glory. Tom, I cannot say it in this fine words as you can, but uh, please finish my sentence here. Well, you did very well. You did very well. What we're seeing unfolding in the world today is the restoration of the papacy back to his former glory. King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what he was in the old world order before the Protestant Reformation, and that's what he's being restored to today. And it is the formerly Protestant nations of the world, the United States, England, uh, Great Britain, and Australia, and others, who are helping to restore the papacy's kingdom in a capitulation to the papacy. As a matter of fact, an apology for the Protestant Reformation. We're sorry, Mr. Pope, that we destroyed your power. We took away from you all of your kingdoms and all of your realms when you are the legitimate throne of God on the earth. That's what futurism dictates. If there's a future Antichrist coming during this future 70th week of Daniel, then it, then you cannot you cannot believe that the papacy has fulfilled the role of Antichrist all throughout history. And therefore, the basis of the Protestant Reformation was built on a lie. And therefore, the Protestant reformers who made a mistake and overturned the throne of the Pope have to restore it. It's the obligation now of the Protestant nations of the world to restore the Pope to his rightful position, according to the papacy. Of course, the papacy, we assert, is the man of sin, the son of perdition. And so they are unwittingly and ignorantly helping to create a new world church state for the Pope. It's nothing new at all. It's simply the restoration of the old world order. The new world order is simply the restoration on a global scale of the old world order. And to fulfill a future 70th week of Daniel. Now, if you read about the 70th week of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, there has to be a seven-year period of time. There has to be, and in this case, not Christ, but the Antichrist who will confirm a covenant for seven years. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. 
Now, if we're talking about sacrifices and oblations being caused to cease, well, then they must have been reinstituted, right? Despite the fact that our scripture says there's no other sacrifice for sin and that God ripped the veil of the temple, thus ending animal sacrifices or any other kind of sacrifice. And the scripture that says God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. Futurism asserts that there must be a, built, a rebuilt temple in a re-established nation state of Israel, Jew, or, or rather Jerusalem being its capital, and, 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 a, and, a, and a, a Jewish people living in the land, and therefore there would be no need for animal sacrifices. The Jews are the only ones who believe in animal sacrifices. And here we have the modern nation state of Israel. None of it's necessary. Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. He's the one who confirmed a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week gave up his life, became the sacrifice. God ripped the veil of the temple. Seventh week of Daniel's all over. We are the beneficiaries of the 70th week of Daniel. Our Messiah has come. But Rome says, no, we have to have a do-over of the 70th week of Daniel. Therefore, there has to be a modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land, a demand for a temple, and animal sacrifices to be reinstituted, and it will be the Antichrist who will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease by ending the animal sacrifices at three and a half years later. There's this whole seven-year period. It's all a sham. Every bit of it, it lock, stock, and barrel, every lie is, is, is contained in it, and it is the ecumenical evangelibellies, the former Protestants who once protested the Church of Rome, have now capitulated, believing in futurism, exonerating the papacy by their belief, and now helping Rome to perpetrate this future 70th week of Daniel. And the logical explanation of this future, this futurist interpretation of Daniel prop, Daniel's prophecy is to present not Jesus, but the Pope as the Christ. And the whole Christian world is helping this delusion. The, pro, the former Protestant United States of America and all its churches are all for this current nation state of Israel. They want a temple built on Temple Mount. They want the Jews to begin animal sacrifices again, which is absurd if you read the Bible. God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. Jesus was the sacrifice. Take him or leave him. God will no longer accept animal sacrifices as a substitute for his son. Despite what the plain English of the Bible says, they are all as though they were automatons fulfilling the Pope's futurist 70th week of Daniel. The papacy has, comp, uh, has co-opted the whole of Christendom and put them on the side of redoing Daniel's 70th week. And it can be for one purpose and one purpose only. That is to present the Pope as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It has no other purpose but to deceive God's people if it were possible to deceive the very elect, and it has. There's no biblical mandate for the current nation state of Israel. There's no biblical foundation for the rebuilding of a temple in which God will never dwell, there's no biblical justification for animal sacrifices, which will be a stench in the nostrils of God. A final repudiation that Jesus was the lamb. Can I come in here, Tom? Yes. If the modern nation state of Israel had any biblical support, 
Jesus would be a liar. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody, nobody, nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's right. Therefore, also the Jews have to reject their believing of rejecting Jesus Christ. And they have to accept Jesus Christ because he is the only way to the Father. That's right. And because he is the only way, there is no need for a nation state of Israel. This is all going to be one big concentration camp over there. That's right. What Hitler started to achieve with, an, I don't know, 20, 25 concentration camps, the Jews go voluntarily all there alone into that one. When they are all gathered there together, how easy is it to wipe them out? And that's what Satan wants. Because the Jews, as the remnant of the bodily Israel of the Old Testament, are the ones who gave us the gospel. And we Christians are to provoke these Jews to jealousy of our salvation that is in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I think it was Romans 10 or 11, right? Yes, I believe so. Where he spoke about that we are to provoke the Jews to jealousy. So we have to love the Jews, but that doesn't mean that we can put them in a concentration camp over there. That doesn't and we mean, certainly... That doesn't mean, Tom, sorry, that doesn't mean that we have to support that state of Israel over there. No, we should shout to them, come out of there! It's a trap! You remember that saying of this one in, the, in this movie Star Wars, this guy? It's a trap! It's a trap! Yeah! The modern nation-state of Israel is a trap for all the Jews in there who are caught in there believing that there lies their salvation. Their salvation only lies with Jesus Christ. That's Please. right. That's right. Rome's, if, as I assert, that the papacy, which calls itself the vicar of Christ, is really, in actuality, the vicar of Satan on the earth. What would he wish to do to those who brought us the oracles of God, the Jews, the nation of Israel? He would have them eat and drink damnation to themselves, relying once again upon animal sacrifice, thus proving once again before the eyes of the world and before the eyes of God and before the eyes of our Messiah Jesus that they reject Jesus. There's no other reason to make an animal sacrifice but to demonstrate once again their rejection of Jesus the Messiah. Isn't that what Satan would want for them? To cause them to eat and drink damnation to themselves? Isn't that what they do in the Roman Catholic Church when they sacrifice Christ afresh every day on the altars of the Roman Catholic Churches all over this world? Another sacrifice, as though Christ dying for us was not enough, that he has to die over and over and over and over again. How, how better to minimize what Jesus did on the cross than to crucify him over and over and over and over again, a perpetual sacrifice, they call it. And how is that any different than causing the Jews to build a temple and to begin animal sacrifices, but to prove to God one final time, we reject your lamb, we want to offer our own. Israel was created for nothing other than the spiritual and physical destruction of the Jews. The answer to the final Jewish question. Rome has nothing but perdition in store for everyone who professes himself to be a Jew. When our role as the body of Christ is to provoke the Jews to jealousy for our salvation in Jesus Christ. There's only one hope for the Jew. 
That's to come to Jesus. That is the mission of the body of Christ. And those who preach that they ought to build a nation state of Israel with a temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem and a priesthood to act, offer sacrifices is to be a stumbling block to the Jews. That's what all of Christendom preaches. Total apostasy. All the churches that support the Jews in building this temple and beginning animal sacrifices again are leading the Jews to perdition. They're all on the side of the Pope now. When we should be provoking the Jews to accept Jesus, their lamb. If they had Jesus, if they accepted him as their propitiation, as their lamb, as their sacrifice, sacrificed once and once only, and that we are all washed in his blood, Jew and Gentile alike, what need would there be for a modern nation state of Israel? What need would there be for a temple on Temple Mount? What need would there be for a priesthood to sacrifice animals and make oblations and offerings to the Lord? What temple in Jerusalem will the glory of God stand over nothing. It's a land of desolation and deception and popery. It's a land of a future phony 70th week of Daniel. Do you realize the modern nation state of Israel is for one purpose and one purpose only? To be a stage upon which to act out a counterfeit 70th week of Daniel in order to present to the world a counterfeit Christ. As Christ warned, I've come in my Father's name, and you received me not. And someone else will come in his own name, and in him you will receive. That's right. He was speaking of the papacy. Even Jesus was speaking of the papacy 2,000 years ago. And nobody Jesus, else. Jesus gave us a glimpse at what we can see materially appearing before our eyes in the current modern nation state of Israel. There is one coming in his own name. In other words, one that the Father did not give him. A name that the Father did not give him. And what does the Pope call himself? The Vicar of Christ. God did not give him that title. He gave it to himself. He is no more the replacement of the Son of God than I am. The replacement of the Son of God was the Holy Spirit. And when the Pope calls himself the vicar of Christ, he's calling himself the replacement of Christ on the earth. He is calling himself the position occupied only by the Holy Spirit. He has blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And it is him, this blasphemer, this one who calls himself the vicar of Christ is the one that the Jews are going to receive if we do not save them and lead them to Jesus. Rome has nothing in store for the Jewish people and the world in the modern nation state of Israel but total deception, a total counterfeit gospel, a total counterfeit Antichrist and a total counterfeit Christ. And you'll understand this only if you comprehend that the 70th week of Daniel as prophesied in the book of Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 27 was perfectly and completely fulfilled by Messiah Jesus the Lamb of God 2,000 years ago. If you fudge on one element of that prophecy, failing to see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John its perfect, complete fulfillment in Jesus, you stand ready to receive this lie that's taking place in Jerusalem today and in Israel. You stand in jeopardy of believing the great delusion you stand in jeopardy of losing your eternal life. That's what I'm saying. That's the promise that God gave us. 
and he gives us through the free gift of salvation through his son well tom thank you very much and uh, i want to bring this broadcast here to an end after 90 minutes unbelievable we have almost read one page <laughs> not even that completely but that's not the point i think we made our point in this 90 minutes and right. everybody who listened to this and did not get that point well then you just wasted 90 minutes of your time which is already wasted anyway because if you didn't understand this you will never understand anything that tries to bring you to the truth we have some closing remarks tom i would only ask blessing in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2000 years ago our messiah jesus the lamb of almighty god the one and only king of kings and lord of lords don't look for a future fulfillment of that prophecy you will be deceived Thanks, Jerk, and thank you to your listeners. Yeah, thank you, Tom, also for your closing remarks. And um, don't get me wrong, dear viewer of this video, I am not mad. I am, as Tom, disappointed. Disappointed that some people who say they seek the truth, and when you point them to resources where they can find the truth, most and for all the uncorrupted King James Bible, they just don't want to go there as if it would take some kind of a big effort it does not the truth is only to be found in one place and that is the Bible and we can read as many books on hour of the truth or on Inquisition updates or whatever as we want if you don't pick up the Bible that gives you the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you will always not have the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now, as you probably saw through uh, the video, um, there's an email address where you can contact Tom if you have any questions or remarks on that. He can be reached on tom at seawaves.us. Tom at seawaves.us, like the waves of the sea, S e a w a v e s tom at cwaves.us and he's looking forward to get in contact with you especially when you have a message like now i finally get it and me you can always reach via my youtube channel in the comment section of the video or you can send me a personal message uh, via my youtube channel of course to reach me okay that's all for today. Thank you very much for watching and listening. Until next time, Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know there is heaven also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. Your God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.